In it comes. There goes the shot on goal. It's in. It's in. Jamie 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 Now you can make a strong case for my next guest to have been the best female player to have played the game. Rochelle Hawkes is the only female hockey player to have won three Olympic gold medals, 1988 in Seoul, 1996 in Atlanta, and one of her most cherished at her home games in Sydney 2000. She's a five-time Champions Trophy gold medalist, two-time World Cup gold medalist, a Commonwealth Games gold medalist. As I mentioned, She's a three-time Olympic gold medalist. She's a member of the Order of Australia for services to hockey. She played 279 times for the Hockey Roos. She captained the side for over eight years. She sits alongside Dawn Fraser and Andrew Hoy as the only Australians to win gold medals at three separate Olympic Games. She also had the honour of reading the Athlete's Oath at the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games, which I'm so excited to chat to her about. All this equates to Rochelle being considered the most successful female player in international hockey history. And we're about to learn how it all came about and the person behind the player. Uh, Rochelle, welcome and thanks for having a chat. Thanks, Mark. Very welcome. Um, What did it take to achieve, you know, these feats and reach these heights? Well, everyone knows that um, playing sport at the highest level takes a lot of commitment and I think um, the statistics will tell you about 1% of the population make it to an Olympic Games. So it's very wow. slim pickings. And the amount of dedication required to your craft to get there is significant. And I know myself, I had the dream from a very young age to play a sport at the highest level. It didn't yeah. matter what it was, but um, through influences in my life, parents and um, other people, hockey was the, the sport that I pursued. And I know the journey wasn't always easy and there were a lot of uh, downtimes, but uh, the rewards that uh, came with it, winning three gold medals and a number of other championships along the way were the reward that I needed. But and certainly it's a really difficult and challenging path and your mindset has to be very strong to be yeah. able to stand up to the rigors of high performing sport. Oh, and I'm I'm looking forward to exploring, you know, all those aspects you mentioned. Um, but we'll go to the very start. Born in Albany, moved around the regions a bit. Do you consider yourself a country girl? I certainly do. Uh, born <laughs> in Albany, didn't stay there long, a couple of years yeah. and then moved around to a num- number of regional towns. And I don't think you really take the country out of someone. And that was very much my roots when I, up till the age of 14 and absolutely loved it. And it just really set the platform for me, I think, to become the person I am and, and obviously forge some really great friendships along the way and then have parents who were really supportive, even though we did kind of move from town to town and it was challenging, we managed to forge really great friendships along the way with many families. And it also um, ha- gave me the platform to be able to play many different sports and then obviously um, specialise in one sport when I decided that that was the way I was going to go. Yeah. Yeah. You take the girl out of the country. Can't take the country out of the girl. No, and I, I must admit that when I first came to the city, it was very much like that. And yeah, uh, right. I was yeah. I was um, given, I guess, a bit of a hard time about the way I spoke and it was very country and uh, <laughs> I, I had to kind of change that a little bit over the journey. But um, I, I guess I was proud of the fact that uh, I did I did come from regional areas. It seems to be a pretty common thread from, from country people. I like this next part because we, I feel like we live in a world of instant gratification. Um, and I think resilience is the casualty. Uh, I know that's a sweeping statement, but I want to go back to a teenage Rochelle because is it correct that you didn't make your first rep team until you were sort of 16 years old? Yeah. So I was, I was in Northern, we were living in Northern at the time and, um, I was in year eight and, and year nine, sorry, my, my mother said to me, look, I think you should try it for this state under 16 side. And I was a pretty skinny, scrawny kid and didn't have a lot of confidence. And she was someone who was a bit of a mentor to me and she'd been a a very big part of the fabric of hockey in, in the country. So she sort of coerced me to do that. And I decided that 
I I would have a go and uh, took the trek to uh, the city and and trialled out and managed to make my my first under sixteen a, a team at the age of um, yeah fourteen and I was really proud of that and I thought well could good things come from that and and of course then we had to move to the city after that and yeah. uh, that was sort of the platform that was launched for me in the regional areas but then the the little kid going to the uh, city and then you know your your eyes open up and what's life going to be like when uh, when you do live there yeah country girl in the big smoke yeah what was school like uh, you know i imagine i mean you've sort of touched on it it's pretty difficult moving from from the country to the city um but then school is just another level on top of that absolutely and school was great you know primary school is always some of the best years of your life and high school becomes a bit more challenging yeah uh, kids are maturing. They're they're finding their own little packs, and uh, I, I I did find the back end of life in um, Northern High School quite challenging because I was constantly going back and forth to Perth for training and yep. and playing, and so you're missing out on that social time with friends, and and uh, it became a little bit evident to me that I was losing touch with some of my friends. So uh, the the move to Perth probably came at the right time because okay. then I decided that I really wanted to focus on sport. And uh, that's sort of, um, yeah, where I headed once, once we moved to the city. Yeah. Who do you remember most from school and that time in your life? Were there, were there teachers or, or coaches, you know, when you, when you moved to to Perth that really stick with you? Yeah, well, certainly uh, my last year in Northern, there were a couple of teachers um, that, uh, and they're obviously in the phys ed department, but <laughs> yeah. they really helped sort of forge a bit of confidence and, um, yeah, give me the, I guess, um, the belief that I might be able to achieve something. And then along the way um, in the city, yeah, our under 16 coach, she was um, a great lady and um, yeah, really a, a wonderful coach. And then there were the many other people uh, along the journey that I um, gravitated towards and that really helped me. Because, so am I right in saying that some of the teachers when you moved to Perth were also the coaches of the state team? Well, one of the, um, so one of the teachers, um, who was our under 16 coach, she, she was the coach and she, so you come from a teaching background to coach yeah, a lot okay. of those, those state teams. And, uh, yeah, she was obviously had that teaching expertise and then could display that in terms of how she interacted with the the players, yeah, but also right. then she had a bit of coaching now as well. So it was, um, yeah, good balance to have. Yeah. Was that pa Pam? Uh, Pam Babs? Um, Babs was the teacher in, in Northern. Okay. And then Gail Warrelow was the teacher from Perth that took our state team. Isn't it cool that, I mean, it's, it seems wild now because they're almost full-time jobs, even coaching those rep sides, but you had your teachers who are also your coaches. Yeah, full time job. Yeah. Have to take um, time off to yep. to obviously take the team away, um, eat into their um, you know afternoon um, training hours and um, the yeah. commitment that they put into that to be able to um, you know get the side to a to a point where they could represent the state with pride. Yeah, is a testament to to all teachers out there who take on those roles. Yeah, we sit here now reflecting on, on an unbelievable list of achievements but let's go back to this 16 year old Rochelle or perhaps even younger when you make this under 16 team whose journey was just beginning what did you think you might be able to achieve or what did you want to achieve in the game of hockey yeah, once the confidence started to grow and I first made that team there was very much the decision that I wanted more and I did play a number of other sports. I, I loved every sport <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you know, basketball was one and squash and tennis and softball, you name it, I played it and even, even played in a powder puff derby in Northern, which was the railways versus federals. My, my first ever kind of official football game, even though I used to have a kick out, um, in the front yard with the neighbors. What and, did you and, just call it? Yeah. The powder puff derby the back powder in the day. Puff derby. And that, that name you would, <laughs> you would not, um, now, you know, use in terms of, um, women's football, but back in the day, oh, that's wh right. what it was called. Yeah. Which is a, a, obviously a very discriminatory name, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but women didn't have a football competition back then. We're talking many, many years yeah. ago. 
and it was like a precursor to the the men's game um, that followed. And you played in that? Yeah, played in that with my mother, um, by oh, the way. That's... And um, she was she's a very soft and gentle and and loving person, and everyone just adores her. But when she got on the field that over that white line, she really was very um, aggressive and I now know where I got that from and <laughs> I still remember vividly her tackling um, one of um, the females in the other team and she just had this vice-like grip and tackled her and she threw her and she ended up um, flying through the air about 20 metres. So <laughs> I thought to myself, that's my mum and that's where I got it from. So I sort of from that moment on knew that there, in the genes there was um, that real will and desire and that mental fortitude and that toughness to to want to take it to the next level. So yet then I, there was no holding me back. I, I wanted to um, play <laughs> hockey at the highest level. And once I came to Perth, had to make a decision yeah. and decided that I would focus in on the hockey rather than other sports. That yeah. is amazing. Yeah. I hadn't heard that yeah. story yeah. before. Yeah, yeah. The old the white powder line. puff derby, but we do not call it that because no. we know the, the – um, AFL W is just absolutely oh, going, yeah, yeah no, going through the roof. And um, in terms of um, the, you know, wh- where it's gone, come from, and where it is today, um, it has just it's moving beautifully in the right direction. But do you know what? It's it's kind of also important to acknowledge names like that because it does show how far we've come. Yes, like, exactly. Back I did, in I the didn't, day, and and yep. look, I, I'm uh, you know probably one one generation removed from how you grew up. And that was, I didn't even understand what you meant by powder puff. So, yeah, yeah, Which is absolutely. a good thing, I think. But um, no, it is cool. And I think it's absolutely wild that your mother, who's so gentle, yes, is yes. able to sort of just flick a switch, yeah. um, which is interesting to say that that's where you get it from. Because I was going to ask you about your uh, demeanor on the field. You were, you were a reasonably tough player. Um, that seems to be, I suppose, embedded in you. Yeah, for sure. And And dad didn't hold back either and he played a bit of football in his day and he was pretty aggressive on the field so yeah. I guess I had nowhere to go other than to to be that tough sort of um, athlete and yeah very much tough on the field and um, fair but I would certainly not um, hold back if you know someone um, was quite tough or aggressive with me I would certainly push back yeah. and um, that was to play it tough but be fair was very much my motto and to never give in and and that was another thing that I think was really ingrained in me from a young age from growing up with um, pr- two pretty um, pretty tough parents yeah yeah yep uh, this will be wild to those people who listen to it but tell me Rochelle how does somebody get selected for their country before even playing for their state? Yeah, it was a, it was a, <laughs> and certainly I played underage state, but hadn't played yeah. before the state senior side. And the coach, uh, the late great Brian Glencross, saw something in me. He'd um, probably watched a bit of club hockey and decided that I might be someone for the future. So I sort of got plucked out of the underage system and, and catapulted into the Australian team. And it was a very much a culture shock to me. Some of those players had been there for many years and you come in and you think you're a little, um, you know, but you can be a bit of an upstart and thought that it was all going to fall in place. And they pretty much put you back in your place very quickly. And it was yeah, not an easy ride. You, you first get in, you've got to do your hard yards. And I realized that, yeah, this was another level and I needed to step up. And it was just, I was so grateful to be selected for the team. And I remember it vividly, a series against Germany and playing in Tasmania on the grass yeah. in 1985. And this is before. On the grass. Uh, on the grass. And, <laughs> and, and the AstroTurf came in a few years later and we started to play more competitions wow. on that. But um, yeah, many, many tournaments, um, you know, prior to that had been played on grass. So we had to make that transition to AstroTurf. Hockey. Yeah being played on grass yeah, like yeah. that seems wild yeah absolutely yeah yep. um look things do start going well for you uh and you're in line for soul selection um I-, I love this part of the chat particularly because for so many people when i ask this question their faces light up do you remember where you were and how you got the message that you were going to the 1988 Seoul olympic games to play for your country yeah it's it's an amazing experience isn't it like you just think wow is this really happening? Get the phone call. Is this me? 
am I going to go to the Olympic Games? So it was a phone call yeah, for you? Yeah, phone call. Yep. Am I going to go to the Olympic Games? Yes, you are. You're <laughs> on your way. And, um, yeah, the rest is history. And, and then you just sort of wonder who else is in the team. Yeah. And then finally you all come together and you realise um, that this 16 has been chosen to, to go to the Olympic Games in Seoul. So where were you when you got this call? I was at home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, parents were around and oh. um, it was like, wow. And you knew it was coming? The, you well, were expecting a call? Well, yes. Expecting a call yes because no. then they, they obviously tell people who haven't been selected. So, yeah, yeah very much an exciting moment. Who called you? Uh, the coach. Yeah. Yeah. Who, yeah. And who was that at that the time? That was Brian Glenn that Cross was at Brian. the time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So really exciting moment and, um, yeah, one I'll never forget. How old were you when you got that phone call? 21. 21. Yeah. So I was 21 when I made the Seoul Olympic team. Oh, that is amazing. Um, I can see it in your face too. It's like that must be – is that one of the most special moments of, of your life? I Like we're, we're going to chat about some – definitely some special moments to come, but – I just feel like a call to say, hey, you're going to represent your country at an Olympic Games. Yeah, it was. I think because it was the unknown, I'd never been to yeah. a Games before. And when you go to something for the first time, you anticipate that it's going to be really exciting, but it's also the fear of the unknown as well. What are you stepping into and yeah. walking into that village Olympic life? You see <sighs> all these towering units and Australia has one particular block and it's about 26 stories high and there's Aussie flags outside all the windows and then you walk through, meander through the Olympic village and there you turn to your left and you see Steffi Graf and she's riding a push bike through the Olympic village <laughs> and I'd watched her play at Wimbledon and I was just in awe of that and, and you just see these amazing athletes just walking through as if you're walking down the yeah. main street just and living just living their life yep. and it was an incredible feeling and so so that, the anticipation of that and going and then feeling what that Olympics is like, that village life and um, getting to taste all the different cuisine, which wasn't that good, by the way. The, <laughs> the food at the Olympic Village in Seoul, I have to say, was um, very subpar. Okay. But, but you know, you, you get by and, and you, you do what you've got to do to get enough fuel in you to, to be able to perform. But it's just another level, another world, and it is so exciting. Oh, that's cool. Um, a pretty common theme of, of all these stories, Rochelle, is uh, resilience to get through injury. Um, and you, you needed to call on this pretty early, I believe, and leading up to Seoul as well. Was it compartment syndrome? Yeah, I, I, I was diagnosed with compartment syndrome in um, 1986. Yep. And, um, well, 19, yeah, in 86 and had to have an operation and... I thought that after, um, you know, having that first operation and leading into Seoul that I would be perfectly fine and, yeah. but in high performing sport and like all in injuries, you don't necessarily overcome them straight away. So I kind of managed to get by leading into Seoul in 88. I'd, I'd had that first operation, um, but I had this sort of niggling pain still and I, I still wasn't fine. I, I, I wasn't a hundred percent and I got to go to Seoul, but didn't really perform at the very best I could because I was a little bit, um, limited in what I could do because my body wasn't holding up. So post, uh, Seoul, I went back and had more tests done on my legs and they operated again. So I had the front of my compartments done the first time. And oh. then the second time I had to have the side of my compartments done. And then finally, once I had that second operation, it made a huge difference and I could then perform at another level. Yeah. And yeah, so going to Seoul was wonderful and fantastic. And I was so appreciative of being selected, but I knew there was more in the tank because I was being limited yeah, in, okay. in being able to perform at my very best. So having that second operation in 1989 just really helped and, and set me on another path, yeah. which was wonderful. Well, you've made this kind of difficult for me, Rochelle, because you're a quadruple Olympian, which means that we don't have enough time to talk about every Olympic Games in depth. Sydney will be the one I focus on, but I, I will touch briefly on each of, of your campaigns. 
what was Seoul like? You were you were a young woman, as as, as we've heard. You didn't enjoy the food. Yes, <laughs> but no, besides not that, at all. Um, you know, playing Olympic games, you we won the gold medal. Um, what are your memories of the Seoul Olympic Games? Absolutely wonderful. Yep. Really enjoyed it. The interaction, the camaraderie with the wider Australian team was amazing. And it was just so much fun. And I remember the games were intense and then getting to that final, there was so much going on. But I knew once we won that gold medal and not really paying, playing um a significant role, but playing a role, I wanted. I knew there was more to what I wanted to achieve. Um, but the actual games was really fascinating. It was the first time that the Australian women's team had won an Olympic gold medal in hockey, yeah. which was incredible. And it was a first and, and we really celebrated that. But a really interesting factor, and, and you can talk, I guess, about the amateurish nature of Olympic sport back then and, and certain sports, we were given um, by the Australian Olympic Committee a certain reward. There was gold, silver and bronze um, rewards in terms of financial okay. gain. And I remember, I think it was, if I remember correctly, $16,000 for each gold medalist. Wow. But if you were a team, you had to divide it amongst the 16 oh, in the team. Okay. So um, we had um, Debbie Flintoff King, she won a gold medal then, and Duncan Armstrong. So they took home the full amount. Yeah, and yeah. then I think it equated to something like 800 US dollars or oh, something wow. like that each. So that was, you know, put down um, on the bar uh, uh, celebrating after <laughs> the Olympic gold medal. So that that went pretty quickly, but uh, times have changed and we've sort of, uh, I mean, Olymp many Olympians are still sort of um, struggling yeah. in terms of financial reward, but there's a lot more incentives, I think, for Olympians in this um, current uh, era than there was back then. One last brief one on Seoul. There was a little bit of stress in the final, wasn't there? Because to win a gold medal, I believe you have to have played uh, every, like an individual player must have played at least a second on the field. And were there not two two players in the final who hadn't come on yet? Yeah, they had to have played um, for, I think it was a minute or two minutes okay. to actually qualify. Now that doesn't matter, but yep. in this um, current era, but back then you had to have been on the pitch and I think it was one to two minutes and two players hadn't set foot on the pitch because back then it was the substitution rule. Yeah. So if you yeah. came off, you couldn't go back on and now it's interchange, so it doesn't really yeah. matter and everyone gets a go now, but these two players needed to be put on in the last two minutes and our goalkeeper was put on and she had to make three or four saves and um, it was really <laughs> difficult, challenging. It was tense. And then was the game in the balance, the game, the game was still in the balance. Yeah. And, um, you know, anything could happen a couple of shots on goal yeah. and they could have been well back in it. So she had to make some crucial saves <laughs> and then our field player had to come on and, um, we managed to, to get them on, but it was tense. And we had players yeah. from the sideline yelling at the coaches to get the players on because they, we all knew the deal. Yeah, and yeah. in fact, what the coaches had decided um, oh, they'd come up with a plan that if we couldn't get the goalkeeper on, we would have a playing shirt for her and she would go on as a player. Oh. But it was just, it was that tense and it went down to the wire. But in, in the end, they put her on as goalkeeper. But they, they'd come up with this alternate plan that maybe she could wear a um, another sh playing shirt and go on as a field player. So that all these plans in place, yeah. but luckily and thankfully both of them got on in the f last couple of minutes and both got a gold medal. So all 16 ended up with How's a medal. How's the balance of that? Like, you know, we're gunning for an Olympic gold medal, but we also want you, you're not clearly in our best 11 or whatever, uh, you know, whatever. And but we want you to win a gold medal. So like we're balancing this up. Yes, that's right. That's crazy. And, and it's hard. And, and, and it was the, clearly in your mind as well, like as a teammate. Yeah, you're like, we, we really were want protecting to... the players. The players on the pitch were yelling out to get those players on. It was incredibly oh intense and there was a lot of planning that went into it prior yeah. to that game. And luckily, unfortunately, now it's, 
it doesn't matter because yeah. you will, if you're in that team, you will get a medal. But back then it really did matter and it changes lives and it impacts people in ways that you just can't imagine. Yeah. Um, 88, 96 and 2000. So there is a gap in there, Rochelle. Yes. And these, these powerful hockey roos didn't have the tournament they'd hoped for in Barcelona, 1992. Um, well, you didn't have the result that you hoped for. How do you reflect on that? What, what happened in Barcelona? We trained really, really hard, but probably didn't train. Now they do a lot of match simulation. We did a lot of running and a lot of stop start sort of um, drills. And I think if we would played more match simulation um, training, we've done more match simulation training, that probably would have worked in our favour. We did a lot of long distance running, 10Ks, you know, a couple of times a week, a lot of running um, after games, that sort of thing. I think had the training been tweaked slightly, there could have been a different outcome, but you'll never know. I mean, you know, these are just um, hypotheticals, but yeah. certainly we were a bit flat and we didn't perform at our very best. And yeah. there's some of the, I think, reasons for it. And then, you you know, you've got to um, have contingency plan. So if you're not playing at your best, you still need to be a two or three goal better team than the opposition. So that if you're not at your best on that day, you're still going to get the outcome you yeah. want. And it, it was pretty close back then in terms of um, the rankings and teams being pretty close to each other. But yeah, that certainly was a factor and, and the way we trained and then the, we, we certainly overdid the running. Okay. Mm. Isn't it? Yeah, it's fascinating and there's so it's probably no surprise that there is like a multi-million dollar industry into the sports science behind this now to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, well they're fine lines and, yeah. and, and, and winning and losing and then you tweak things, you change and then there's a lot of copying, isn't there? Like yep. a, you, a team might be a groundbreaker in a certain area and every team will follow them. Yeah. And and I know back then um we were one once we um sort of moved into the next phase where we became really successful we were some pioneers in some innovation and yeah. other teams just they wanted to jump on that bandwagon uh the atlanta games in 1996 they ended up in gold which is obviously fantastic was that a sense of redemption leading up to to the atlanta games yeah we certainly we we knew that there had been a bit of a shift in the way we approached our hockey, the way we trained together, the professionalism of the group, it all shifted. And I knew that there was a momentum shift and we were moving in the right direction. Yeah. And if we could continue this, we could be a very, very successful team. Yeah. And and did you ride that? Like, was it at the back of your mind when you were competing in Atlanta, like, if we feel like we should have won in Barcelona or oh, we knew we had it, but we didn't get it. Like this is ours. Like we've got to take this. Well, I think there were, there was a lot of change in personnel. So yeah. many of those thoughts around Barcelona had shifted and the team had moved on, but we, we certainly knew some of those players that were still there from Barcelona, they wanted this more than ever because we knew we'd let that slip away. Yeah. So there was certainly that feeling a little bit of redemption, I guess, but if we played at our very best, we knew that we could win this thing. Yeah. yeah. And you did. And then, you know, I, I get chills whenever I think or talk about Sydney 2000. I, I honestly do. Um, I was lucky enough to be there. I was eight, but I, I have brief memories of it. But with a mother and father so heavily entrenched in the WA contingent, you know, I was so fortunate to have been there. And I have this overwhelming sense of pride um, with it being our home games. Like I, I even look back at videos now and I'm just, I get, I get the chills. What were your feelings leading up, leading up to the games? It was a really interesting one because we knew it was going to be pretty exciting. There was going to be a lot of pressure and a lot of eyeballs on those teams and those individuals who were favoured to, to win a medal. So it was intense. There and was the a hockey lot of, of lo course, lot of scrutiny. Ian Thorpe, Kathy Freeman, the hockey ruse, unbackable odds as the newspaper alluded to. And 
we knew it was going to be intense, but we also, on the flip side of that, knew we'd get a lot of Australian support. There'd be big crowds. Uh, you'd have your family and friends there. And the games, no matter what the press was saying, were going to go on and they were going to get through them because there'd been a lot of conjecture about the transport's going to be terrible, <laughs> things are not going to be finished, it won't be a very good games and and how wrong they were oh. because it was just sensational and the atmosphere was incredible. And I knew as soon as we walked into the village and the atmosphere around that village was unbelievable and the best I've ever felt. It was electric. People were just so happy. There was a buzz around the place and you could feel it and sense it. And there was a really big anticipation about going to the opening ceremony and and teams and individuals in previous games, many of them wouldn't have attended an opening ceremony if their event was on the next day. Uh But because we actually didn't play the next day, fortunately, but some athletes and teams have to make individual athletes and teams have to make that very difficult decision Mm -hmm. not to march in the opening ceremony. And we have done that previously in games if we've played the next day. So Sydney, there was no way we're going to (laughs) to miss out on this one. And the opening ceremony, everyone so looks forward to it and it didn't let us down. It was just incredible. And that moment you knew the games had arrived and you knew that the support was there and this was going to be an incredible Olympic Games. Oh, I get, yeah. I get chills even listening to that answer, Rochelle. But um, let's be honest, this opening ceremony carried a little bit of extra weight for you personally um, because for over 100 years, one person from the entirety of the athletes and coaches' cohort, uh, this is tens of thousands of people, by the way, when you think about how many there are, uh, is chosen to read the Olympic Oath. And at Sydney 2000, this was you. How, I'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions about this, but firstly, how did that come about? So John Coates, the chef de mission of the Australian Olympic Committee, he decides who will be, well, it's a bit of a, I guess, a c- committee that decide, but ultimately it boils down to him. Yeah. And he decides who will be the Olympic Oath Reader and who will be the flag bearer. And generally it's an athlete who has been to the Olympic Games four or more times. Andrew Gaze was chosen to be the flag bearer. Five, that was his fifth Olympic Games and it was my fourth. And it's, I guess, as long as you espouse some of the um, – Olympic values um, yeah. because that's a really important part of it as well. So I get the call up from the manager, you need to go and see John Coates. And you're always very nervous because he's obviously the boss, the head yeah. honcho of the Australian Olympic Commission So committee. And so we, I walk up there, great anticipation, and I say, what's happening, uh, Mr Coates? And uh, <laughs> he says, well, Andrew Gaze is going to be the flag bearer. I'd love you to read the athlete's oath. And I was so flattered and really what it was a wonderful opportunity. And he said, just keep it a secret for 24 hours. And I said, no problem. But he said, you know, would your family like tickets? And I said, absolutely. So the family got tickets and got to go to the opening ceremony. And I still vividly remember it walking into the stadium and you just had so many people down there underneath in the tunnel as we were about to walk out and it was just electric and everyone just stopped, all the Australian athletes, and kind of looked at each other and took a moment and, yeah, it was really emotional because people knew once they walked out there that they had the nation behind them. Yeah. So, yeah, we walked out and back in the day, you know, typical Australia, very, I guess, what would I say, some sort of country theme to it. There was um, riders on horseback. There were yeah. all sorts of this Kylie on a thong. There was, you know, <laughs> it was very um, typical Australian that um, that digger sort of mentality yep. and we went back to our past roots. And so once we walked out there, the um, crowd had these green and gold socks on and they were just like waving them. 
was just amazing and kind of the only um, information I'd been given is um, wear this pink tag and it was a very cheap plastic pink tag and it had O3 reader on it. <laughs> and so we had to do our lap and then they said when you get to the end someone will find you and they did. They sort of plucked me out yeah. of nowhere and then got to deliver the oath and it was just an incredible experience. So in preparing for our chat today, I, I actually watched it. Um, and again, like I'm such a sports nuffy, but this whole time I have actually chills and, and I watched you deliver that. Um, yes or no, do you know how many people were estimated to watch, have watched this opening ceremony worldwide? I don't know exactly, but there were a lot of exaggeration. They said 4 billion people be watching that sort of thing. So I don't know what the exact number was, but that was the sort of message I was getting leading up. So I was getting more and more nervous about delivering it because of those numbers. I, well, you're right. I mean, we probably can't know exactly, but from my reading, it was 3.7 billion people around the world. Um, On, to be honest, one of the most monumental nights in the history of Australian sport, like, and I think the more we reflect on it, that is huge. The Sydney Olympic Games opening ceremony. How was it when you delivered that oath? Yes, I, I reflect back and I go, I should have done this and I should have. So critical. And yeah, I mean, I got to deliver it, but you go, oh, that didn't sound good and should have done that. But it was just amazing because yep. I could see all the hockey people, all the players, male and female, right at the front, and they're just sort of looking at me, and I made sure I looked (laughs) over the top. But, you know, it was a buzz. And then to see Kathy light the cauldron and for it to stop for 10 seconds, and apparently it was a $10 engineering part that was, yeah, it was it was uh-huh. like a $10 part that they had to quickly fix and, and then up it went. But she just did such a sensational job. Mm. It was done so beautifully well. And I think everyone would would be very, very proud of what a showcase Australia put on. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think, I oh, hope I'm right here, was it Juan Antonio Samaranch? I When he was in the closing ceremony, I think he said these are the best games we've ever had. Like Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I remember that sticks in yeah, my mind. Yeah, the best games ever. And, yeah. um, and I think he called it Sydney. Sydney, Sydney, <laughs> the best games ever. And it was. It was yeah. incredibly uplifting. Um. You mentioned, yeah, the the Hockey Roos carried a fair bit of expectation leading into Sydney. Um, Through the discussions that you and I have had, it wasn't an Olympic campaign without friction, was it? There was, tell me about how the group was feeling, particularly leading up to the semifinals. Yeah, look, I think there's always going to be friction when there's competition and there's challenge and people miss out on spots. I mean, we had 25 girls in that squad leading into Sydney, so we had... 16 players that went to Sydney and and obviously those that missed out. So there's tension around selection and you have to really manage that well and the expectation and then the fallout for those that don't make it. Then there, you know, was tension uh, in our first game. We didn't play particularly well against England and there was quite a bit of attention from the coaches to players and I copped a bit of that as well. And <laughs> It didn't start off particularly well and then we sort of moved through the tournament and then um, we get to the final and we're going to play in the gold medal match and there was, I guess, some debate by the coaching team, well, who are we going to appoint as captain for the day because the 1999 through to 2000 we had no particularly, uh, no captain who was um, named it was a rotation system. So the leaders in our group, of which there are about 10 to 12 players um, in that 25 group squad, they rotated the captaincy throughout each game. Sure. But can I just say, you'd been leading the Hockey Roos for, was it eight years? To this so point? what happened was uh, 93, I was named captain um, of the team and then was sole captain till 96. And then, oh, we started bringing in co-captains in 95, but 96 in Atlanta, I was sole captain. And then post that, um, we had co-captains and then 1999, we went to captainless. And um, that was a belief of our coach, Rick Charlesworth, that 
uh, you didn't need a captain. Everyone needed to be a leader and step up. And so he decided, and this this was his feedback post, Sydney, that he chose someone else to be the captain in the final because it was my third Olympic Games, fourth Olympic Games, going for the third gold medal, and he didn't want to put too much pressure on me. And to be honest, I think it actually had the opposite effect because by not, um, there was pressure because everyone in the room, once it was announced the morning of the match, um, we had a game day meeting that morning and it was named there, there was looks from players around the room. So it probably created more tension had he, if he'd gone the other way, no one would have said a word. Yeah. So hang on a minute. On the morning of the Olympic gold medal match. Yes. You, you, Australia's probably most experienced player, experienced captain. And the girls all expected you to be captain. Many of them. You know, within every team there's competition. So there's always some that think that they should be a leader over someone else. But the majority, there was that expectation. And And when it wasn't announced, it created a buzz and um, a distraction. And I think had he kind of stayed with the status quo of what happened in previous games and, and tournaments, no one would have said a word or or looked or um, were concerned about that um, can you, that decision. Can you tell me how you were feeling in that yeah, moment? Yeah, I, I can tell you that I felt a little bit let down and I was like, and I don't like my, one of my key drivers is to be not, uh, to not be made to look silly in front of other people or, yeah. you know, be called out and so I felt like the spotlight was on me which I don't like and I just then went into my show and then I had to compartmentalize it and I went it's not about me this is about the team winning we're in team sports so went back to the room and just had some quiet time and then just said get on with it and got on with it um but it was a challenge there's no question about that um almost uh, this is, it feels like such a dirty word, but did it tarnish the experience in Sydney at all? Not at the time because we were on such a euphoric high sure. yep. and there was so much going on. But post reflection, some years later, yeah. it, it, it has impacted me because, yeah, you do reflect on that and you kind of think, well, the reasoning I think wasn't really sound and. Yeah, there should have been a bit more respect there, I think. Let's focus on on the euphoria that you spoke about. So the whistle blows. You're a, a three-time Olympic gold medalist. Um, that's, yeah, that's crazy to think of, by the way. Um, and this time you're in your home country. Do you remember the feeling when the whistle went? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Relief, excitement, enjoyment had pre-planned if we win, those sticks are going up in the crowd and <laughs> went around and threw them and uh, apparently the feedback I got because there were people I know that were in the crowd near where I threw the sticks and just about took someone's head off apparently and <laughs> then there was a bit of a, a fight between a guy behind and, um, oh, no. uh, yeah, someone in a wheelchair and everyone's going, give it to the guy in the wheelchair. And oh, so, God. Yeah, so I created a, a little bit of a stormy environment but – but they sorted it out. He got the the stick, and um, they were very grateful. That's yeah, it's amazing. Um, am I? Did you retire at this moment? Yes, straight yeah. away I retired. And was that and always the plan? Always the plan. Okay. And had had enough. And and what gets most athletes is the grind. It's just yep. the daily grind of um, doing the same thing over and over again, and then your body starts to become a little bit worn down and your mind becomes weary and you just you look forward to having a break and doing some other things but also when you cast your mind to another four years time and that's such a long way away because pinnacle of our sport is the olympic games you think i'm just not going to be there again i can't commit to that so that's really what makes the decision for you yeah um Rochelle, it's always been my intention with this series to sort of bring to light some concepts which we learn from sport but transcend our lives. And I, I really have loved hearing about it from you 
uh, today, but in the discussions we've had, you know, uh, away from from recording here as well. And the reason I'm about to ask this question um, is because it's I can see how important it is for you to be involved in sport. So I want to ask you um, explicitly, how important is sport at any level to our community and the individuals that are part of it? I think sport is just the vehicle that brings people together, the socialisation that you get from sport, the potential to get the best out of yourself, whether you're playing with your friends or whether you're playing at the highest level, you can try and push yourself as far as you want to go. The wonderful experience that kids can have coming through sport and the friendships they make and some children decide to go into a more high-performing sport, that's okay. But there's pathways where you can just play with your mates and that's great too and that's really, really important. And what it does is it it creates friendships for life. It creates networking opportunities where you can tap into your networks and help you in your business life. Then you can bring families together. Hockey's a really a family-friendly sport, so mums and grandparents play, mums and dads play. You can play up until you're 80, 90, mm-hmm. you know, if your body's still holding up. And then your kids can play. It's very, very enjoyable. And to, for the whole family to go to a game on a weekend or um, to support the Australian teams playing um, when they're in town, that's just a really valuable thing to have. And not everyone has to play sport. And I don't, I don't push people to say everyone has to be sporty. But what it does do is it brings us together and it, it creates a connection. And you just have to look at high-performing teams and when they're doing well, how it just brings a nation along for the ride. And yeah. we've seen some great examples of that clearly in recent times. And everyone just loves a winner. At the end of the day, because the way our brains are wired is we are competitive beasts. Yep. It comes from our Neanderthal days. Yeah. And so we had to fight tooth and nail to survive. So most people have this competitive drive where they will fight for survival. So we want to be winners. And even if you're not competitive at sport, you want to win in something else in life, whether it's a relationship, you want to have a good relationship and win in that. Yeah. You want, Or you might be an artist. Everyone has that drive in them. Some just are more competitive than others in an outward sense. It's... Oh, it's actually amazing to hear that vocalised um, because, yeah, you said we're hardwired for competition and I think the other thing that we're hardwired for is connection. Uh, and hello, sport. is <laughs> Here we are we're talking about sport, which has both of those things in abundance. Absolutely. And sport doesn't have to always be the physical. I mean, now there's walking hockey and <laughs> walking soccer. So yeah. you can still stay connected in sport yep. until... You, you know, you, you can't, you have your last breath. And also if you're not good at, you know, you, your, your, um, skill set might be in an art form. It yep. might be, um, as an engineer, you can still be connected with a sport and not be competitive yeah. and, and still play. You, you, you can go swimming. That's, you know, recreational. That's a sport. There's so many layers to sport. You can go mountain bike riding on the weekends with your mates. That's a sport, but yeah. it doesn't have to be competitive. And I, th- yeah. And I think you've nailed it to, to connect with people is that's what's fundamental to being human, isn't it? Um, I finish Rochelle with the same two questions, perhaps slightly varied here and there, but, but this series, and I, and I really, enjoy asking these two questions. Um, you're a mother as well, which I think gives this first one a, a little bit more oomph to it. Um, what would you say to a young person who looks at the stars on their Instagram or in the telly or TikTok or whatever it might be and says, I want to be an Olympian? What do you say to those people? I think that is absolutely fabulous. That's how I started my journey was looking up to other people and back then we didn't have all the social media platforms and we weren't connected so easily and you'd have to read a newspaper (laughs) or you'd have to look at um, a TV program that might have been tape recorded two weeks previously and and then get it and, and watch it. But it is just so 
valuable to have those role models and aspire to being the best you can be. And at least if you aspire to that and don't achieve it, you've had a go and you've really tried to get the best out of yourself. And that I think is just really vitally important. I, before I ask you this last one, I, just on that, I sometimes worry that with the saturation of, um, and this will actually roll into my final question, but the saturation of what success is, sometimes young kids look at their Instagram or TikTok and they, they, they are, all they see is a 10 second video, right? Is it paint? Uh, and I guess they go, I want to, yep, that's it. I'm going to do that. But how hard that is to do. Um, is sometimes hidden, I feel. Yeah, I think you're right. I think because we live in this instant gratification world, don't we, where everything is at our fingertips and we think that whatever we do, we're going to yeah. um, get it um, because we live in this throwaway society. We get information instantly and then we're on to the next thing. So it is a really difficult environment and, and landscape to navigate because I think the generation coming through do think it's just going to happen. And those resilience um, programs that we need to teach our kids coming up through the primary school mm. um, ages right the way through because you're not always going to get what you want from the first try or the second try or maybe even the third, but it's how you get back up and, and we hear that a lot. But you have to realise there's going to be little trip-ups along the way and if you just give up, then you'll never know what you can achieve. So it's you've got to um, paint the picture that life is not easy. You apply for a job. Two, three hundred other people applying for the job. Yeah. There's maybe a chance you won't get that job. So we talk about sport being competitive. Look at the employment world. It is so cutthroat and competitive. We've got to realise that and building your capability to take those little challenges on and then overcome them and go again. Picking yourself up is in this day and age. It's more required than ever. Yeah. That's, uh, that is invaluable to hear, honestly, mm. uh, uh, particularly to young people. So certainly thank you for that. Um, this is my most cherished question. For me, it's the most important of the lot. It's why I finish with it. I do occasionally feel a little bit hypocritical saying it because we've spoken about all these amazing uh, Olympic triumphs for a person who's been so heavily externally uh, recognized um, like you have, but we you and I both know there's so much more to a person than this. Um, so I won't guide you any further. And I will simply ask, as you sit here today with the experience that you've had and, and the experiences in life that you've gathered together, what does success mean to Rochelle Hawkes? Success means a lot of different things to different people, but my drivers in life are to succeed and achieve. And if I don't do that, then I find that I don't have purpose in life. So I have to continually be looking at ways that I can be successful at something. So it's always looking at new journeys, new tasks, new opportunities, because okay. if I'm not doing that, then I'm not the person that I want to be. And so success for me is being able to set, I guess, those the vision of what you want to achieve in the future, some time frames around it, and then just ticking it off along the way to make sure that you're heading towards that path. And then if you if it changes because of circumstance, then you need to reevaluate and go on a different path. That's okay, but constantly educating yourself about what you want to achieve, where you want to head, and then pivoting if you need to, and then getting support people around you to help you and guide you if you feel like you're not going where you want to go. Sounds like sounds like growth. Yeah. Is that is that the fourth Very of much your mind? a growth mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Is around success. Not feeling around limitations that you put on yourself or others put on yourself. Success is about how you feel about yourself 
with a growth mindset. So yeah. if someone says to you, you can't do that, and you say to yourself, they've said, I can't do that. No, I'm not going to do that. Then that to me is not growth mindset. So a growth mindset for me is Lee, equal success. Yeah. If you take someone who has said you can't you count so many athletes that have been told they can't achieve great success, their stories are out there worldwide. Yeah. If someone tells you you can't do something, challenge and ask, well, yourself, well, what can I do differently to get there? I remember at the very start of this chat, I, I rattled off, you know, all these external achievements, but that doesn't define you, does it? No, it doesn't. And uh, it was, that was the journey that I was on, but it doesn't define me. That has happened and I'm grateful, but there's more to do in life yeah. and having family is um, wonderful, but then I want to achieve other things as well. So that's when you turn your attention to what else you can do to grow and, and develop and, and get the best out of yourself. It was a special one for me today, Rochelle, uh, but with the connection you had with my dad, to be honest. Um, and as a bloke who also just loves sport and knows its value to the community and the passion you have for it, I'm extremely grateful as well. So um, I want to say thank you on behalf of, well, of course, myself, but anybody who hears this because some of the, the, the lessons that you've touched on, I think are invaluable. Um, and the passion and outlook you have on life and sport just holds so much value. So thank you so much for, for being so open and honest today and, and sharing it with, with the world. Thanks, Mark. And I just want to say that I was a really big fan of your dad, Wally. And uh, yeah, I'm very grateful to be here today. Thank you. 